Thank you everyone for coming out. Um, I'm Sabri Blackman. I work at Docker. I'm a security engineer. Um, today I'm going to be talking about securing telemetry and observational data stuff. Uh, let me get my mouse back so I can actually do stuff here. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So I thought I had an hour for this talk. I only have 35 minutes. Now 30, so I'm going to go very, very, very quickly um, through these slides. This is going to be more of a how, what the problem is, you should care about this thing kind of talk more than an instructional type of tutorial. Um, I will link to the, GitLab, uh, the GitHub to the demo in case you want to run this at home um, and dig into the configuration and stuff like that a bit more. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and there are some, uh, some instructions on how to run it. Hopefully this will work. That doesn't work. All right, no big deal. So let's get started. Um, as you've kind of already seen, our apps are generating a lot of, of data, right? Um, this isn't a new problem, but as we sort of reach into these microservices paradigms, we are generating even more. We're making the burden a little bit harder on ourselves. Let's see if I can. Oh, okay. Such as we have, you know, more operational data, such as performance metrics and infrastructure system logs. But we also have some of those data is what we consider to be auditable, auditable. Oops. Such as applications access logs, any sort of ACLs um, or policy uh, decisions that you would want to log, any sort of transactional data. Um, and so here's a tweet by uh, Charity Majors um, sort of distinguishing these kinds of data. Um, pretty succinct. Um, both of these kinds of data have very interesting application security and infosec concerns. Um, and even though we're often using the same tools to handle the collection and distribu uh, distribution of this data, the value to an organization can be a little bit different. Um, Engineers, but also auditors, uh, infosec people, BI folks, you know, entire organizations can leverage this data for a diverse set of concerns. And as such, this data can really have a very large value footprint on your entire organization. Um, but what happens when this information leaks? Right? We have examples of this recently. Um, this could be to the public. It could be uh, potentially captured by bad actors. Um, could this damage your reputation? Um, or can this information be valuable for your competitors? And so this is another tweet by Report URI. Um, uh, gentlemen, um, it was an interesting piece on uh, how Git, uh, GitHub and Twitter recently have been uh, leaking password information through their logs. Um, this is bad. Don't do that. But this information wasn't intentionally leaked. Um, to some degree. Um, you can imagine an, an engineer uh, writing a debug statement um, during their development activities and leaving it in, and now your, your application is leaking. Uh, this is so common that there is a CWE written out there for uh, these concerns. And if you follow this, if they you know, had followed this uh, CWE, they wouldn't have leaked password data. But um, this is an extremely common concern um, there's actually quite a bit of information there for anyone who wants to look through it. It's very helpful. It even goes through some mitigating factors and uh, some of the uh, statistical data out there. So we have you know, a pretty large set of observability tools uh, available, available to us in the CNCF. Uh, Prometheus, Open Tracing, uh, Open Consensus, I think, is now a thing um, as well. Um, but there isn't a whole lot of guidance on how to protect this data in transit. Um, that assumes that you're even sort of hip to the fact that you probably should protect this information in transit in the first place. Um, and some of this information really does need to be protected at rest, um, but that's a different talk. Uh, that complexity is very interesting. Uh, feel free to poke me afterwards to talk about that. Um, so now that we kind of understand why it's important, um, we do need to treat these sorts of data a little bit differently. Um, so what are some of these types of observational data? Um, so we have, you know, I think the most obvious one that we think about is uh, time series metrics, right? Prometheus and things like that. 
So this is often what we refer to by uh, telemetry. Um, and so this is often used for performance metrics and uh, things that, you know, if you're using a Java runtime or, for instance, things that you can often get for free, uh, memory usage, CPU usage, things like that. Um, and then, you know, this is also used as useful in determining performance bottlenecks and things like that. Um, but it can also be useful in determining how an app behaves in response to a certain API event or a set of events or maybe the time of day, you know, the load increases for some reason and we're not entirely sure. Um, and then there's another set of, of, another sort of esoteric use of time series data and that we can use it to capture any sort of statistical information that an application thinks is important. Um, in our app, uh, example app, we're using a time series uh, scraped for access and policy statistics. Then we have text logging um, or distributed logging in this particular case, whether it's structured or un uh, stru unstructured. Um, and, and logs are a little bit different in that they give engineers more fine-grained context, specific information about events within an application. Um, and so if you're trying to debug a problem, you may get an alert uh, you know, from Prometheus, and then you look at through your logs to figure out what's exactly wrong. Um, some of those logs is relevant for debugging purposes, but some of those logs is also required for uh, audit purposes. If you're, you know, facing compliance and things like that, you may have to audit uh, access or audit uh, certain transactions or database reads or things like that. And then lastly, we have tracing. Uh, there are other types, but that's all we're going to cover today. Um, these are often seen as an extension to logging, but they're really not. Um, that's kind of fighting words in some places. But um, these traces are a little bit weird. They're a combination of logging, but they're distributed and um, if you've never used something or look at, looked at a trace through, uh, say, Jaeger or Lightstep or something like that, um, really what it gives you is a picture of a single uh, API request, for instance, through each hop of your backend system, and it gets information from each one of those hops along the way. Probably should have included an example trace here. That would be helpful. Um, but the, the big difference here between traditional logging and tracing is that because each part of your infrastructure are contributing information to the trace, things like IP addresses or host information can be uh, added and exposed to that trace. And so now you have information uh, infrastructure concerns commingling with application concerns, which makes it very useful from a debugging purpose, but can cause some information concerns. Um, Important note, uh, if you're thinking about implementing traces, uh, these aren't necessarily the best place to add extremely detailed uh, application-specific logging. Um, there really aren't any guarantees of information or uh, detailed sanitation across applications. Um, and so each hop of that, that trace, potentially on how it's implemented, um, you can see all the information from all the previous hops. Um, and so depending on your data, um, your data policy, that might be a no-go. And so the very too long didn't read version of this is there are, these are all tools that are great for debugging and observability purposes, but um, there are important application security and inf uh, information security concerns around all of this data. Um, and the unfortunate truth is that the potential for dangerous information leaks increases the more useful we make this data, right? And so as we add more detail, as we make it more useful for engineers and our operators, it actually increases the value of this information. Cool. And so from, uh, I'm a security engineer, and so I get to deal with this sort of stuff all the time. Bad actors can ga gain valuable introspection into how your applications behave through this data. And so even if you're not necessarily leaking PII or if you're leaking uh, passwords like you know, we've seen recently. If I have access to your Prometheus metrics, I can run experiments 
I can figure out how your application responds to things. I can see what the I.O. load looks like if I spam uh, this particular API endpoint. And so that can be particularly um, damaging um, to your uh, application infrastructure. Um, again, as we add detail, make debugging easier, and auditor is happy, the more valuable it becomes. So this goes into the demo portion. How huh, are we looking on time? Looking okay. And so because I intentionally made this demo a little bit higher level. I'm not going to get into too much details about how um, this stuff is implemented, but I will touch on some important points. Um, and so we're going to look into a case study of this really small, unrealistic, but helpful app. It's a simple secret server. Um, too long, didn't read version. It's a HTTP API in front of etcd where you can store secrets. Um, it's uh, not really secret. The secrets aren't encrypted, but it's good enough for our purposes. Um, it uses the simple username and login password, um, password login, and it has a token-based API access. And so these tokens are actually stored in etcd, and they expire after 15 minutes or something like that. Cool. And so, excuse me. The application uses Prometheus metrics. Um, it actually creates a Prometheus endpoint um, around some interesting sort of like uh, access statistics, um, the number of val logins, inval logins, and things like that. And let's see if this will work. Actually, I will just do this. Cool. So I'm going to show you guys exactly what that looks like in the code here. So this is, again, this is a Rust program. So hopefully this makes sense to you guys. Maybe a little bit bigger. Whoops. But we create a bunch of Prometheus objects here. We have successful log encounters, unsuccessful log encounters. If you're familiar with Prometheus, you understand uh, counters are, uh, they're metrics that you can increase but you can't decrease. Um, and so throughout the, the lifetime of this application instance, um, as there are successful logins or unsuccessful logins or as a secret is set, all of these things get incremented by one. Um, that's really all that means. And they're exposed through a slash metrics endpoint here. Um, and in, interesting little important thing to, to look at here is that the metrics endpoint is uh, hosted on a separate HTTP server from our primary API. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. It makes the Envoy configuration easier, um, but it also means that because we are using Envoy as a proxy, we can bind to a local uh, local IP address as opposed to bind all uh, for the rest of our rest of our API. Um, I've kind of done some some. Uh, HTTP spamming throughout the last couple of hours, and the Prometheus uh, isn't the nicest UI in the world, um, but you can kind of see over time, um, if this were a more realistic example, um, uh, for instance, this is a secret set access denied total. Um, you would expect this thing to increase fairly regularly over time. If there's a massive spike, you can create an alert for that and say, hey, something's going on. Um, so a little bit of make-believe, but um, in a more realistic example, you can imagine how powerful this could be. Cool. Oops. Cool. And so it also in, uh, implements uh, fluent delogging. And so a little bit different than Prometheus. Prometheus is a pull service. Um, in other words, we have to create an endpoint for Prometheus to hit as part of a scrape every configurable amount of time. FluentD is a little bit different. We actually have to push events to FluentD as part of our configuration. And so uh, this example app, uh, it pushes uh, auditable events like access events and system errors and details. Um, but as such, valid and invalid user identities are exposed, which makes it easy for us. And if we want, I can uh, do some pretty log, interesting log aggregation and uh, analysis, we can do that, um, but it does make the contents of that 
of, of those logs particularly vulnerable. So I'm going to go into kind of how our application does that. And that's actually right above here. And so we have this audit event uh, function that you know it's used in quite a few places throughout the the program, including uh, here when you, know, you can see when we verify a password, we create a server event. Um, if it, the if the login is uh, invalid password, for for example, um, nothing terribly terribly interesting here, um, but we can kind of see what that looks like. Oops. In in real life, um, and so this is the uh, sort of a, a follow of the the fluent delogging, and we can see uh, when secrets are created, we can see when secrets are fetched. If you need that level of detail for auditing purposes. Um, you can even see the ID of the session tokens that are created. Um, and then we also have login success for user, user name here, right? You can imagine an engineer wanting to know what user logged in, but now we've, you know, we've verified that a user one exists, right? And that can be potentially useful information. So this is kind of like a high-level overview of what the architecture of our demo looks like. Um, we have three instances of a NetCD database, our simple secret server, there's no load balancing or anything like that. Um, the only important things to note here is that we are using Envoy as a sidecar pattern, in, in a sidecar pattern to create uh, TLS connections between Prometheus and simple secrets and or FluentD and simple secrets. Um, the arrows here are a little bit important because we can actually see that Simple Secrets is pushing information to FluentD and Prometheus is pulling information from Secrets, or Secrets Server. If you were to do something like an open tracing or, um, or an open consensus, they also have push and pull models as well. Um, I think Prometheus also has a push model now. Um, there's an aggregator that you can use. Cool. So this is where it gets a little interesting. Um, so we kind of went over how Envoy and Envoy is used, but let's kind of get into what Spiffy does. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with Spiffy or Spire? That's a lot of people. Good. Um, so I won't go into too much detail here, but um, Spiffy is an open source standard for, uh, it's more than X509 certificates now. Um, uh, but it essentially is an open source uh, standard for workload and application identity. Um, and there's an open source implementation called Spire, which, which, is, what, which is what the demo uses to issue the Spiffy IDs. Um, because they're just X509 certificates, um, we're actually using those certificates with Envoy to encrypt our connections and to prove that if I'm pushing information to Prometheus, it's actually Prometheus because it's X509 certificate says so. Um, and the Spiffy identities are tied to a specific host system and they're rotated regularly. And I will kind of see that in action here in our example where this is a, the logs of the Spire server that's actually issuing the Spiffy IDs. And you can see here that there's Spiffy IDs being issued for the Prometheus proxies, the Simple Secret server itself, uh, FluentD, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can imagine in a much more realistic example, being able to prove that all of the points of communication are trusted and um, are who they say they are can be extremely valuable. And as I said, these SVIDs are used to establish TLS connections in between the app and Prometheus and FluentD. Um, and very long story short, these apps know where data is going to and the tooling knows what app instance is providing the telemetry. Um, and so if you're you know, having a conversation with auditors and you know, they need to know how can you prove that this access information is correct, well, we have these 50 IDs that are tied to the logs themselves and we can prove when they were issued and we have copies of the certificates and et cetera, et cetera. And so it sets up a system of trust in between your application and your telemetry. And let's go into the Envoy config very, very, very briefly because it's, it's pretty much standard Envoy. But um, here's uh, sort of the configuration for FluentD. And important highlight here is that the verify subject alt name actually contains the Spiffy ID that we're expecting FluentD to have. 
And so Envoy is using the Spiffy ID that we are expecting to verify the other end is indeed FluentD. And so before it pushes any sort of information, potentially be uh, interesting to bad actors, it does uh, check. So I want to have enough time for questions. This is the link for GitHub for the Simple Secrets demo. Um, there's a lot of meat there for you guys to dig into. I also have uh, some post, uh, post man uh, collections in there. So if you want to poke around with the API, you can without too much, too much uh, headache. And we have time. Wow. Any questions on that? Yes. Yes. So the baggage is forwarded, actually, uh, is intended to be forwarded, mm -hmm. and it doesn't show up in the after the fact artifacts of the trace. Mm -hmm. So annotating the spans with logs and tags does not add it to the baggage. So how does that actually get exposed through the purpose of uh, through the means of tracing? Mm -hmm. So if you're using open tracing, which is one of the tracing frameworks out there, that's true. Um, so the baggage itself isn't intended to carry any information that is particularly uh, sensitive. Well, it, uh, it can't, we use it to carry a lot of sensitive information, but it never ends up in the trace itself. Unless right. you manually add it as a tag or a log. Right, and so I've actually, there's a previous demo that actually does that, because we were using the baggage itself to carry spiffy IDs, right? Um, and I know there is a, the question was, um, with open tracing particularly, uh, adding, you know, if there's a, is there a danger of adding sensitive information to the trace itself if the contents of the trace isn't carried on to other downstream, right? Um, pretty much, okay. Um, so open tracing works that way. Uh, things like Zipkin are a little bit different. Um, but uh, tracing in general, um, if you can ensure that the connection between your application and the thing that's actually uh, assembling the trace, if you know confidently what aspects of that information is only going to, to you know, say Jaeger or something like that, um, then you can make the determination there. Um, what I've seen is that people don't know or they aren't exactly privy to that sort of thing, and so they're adding things to the baggage or they're adding uh, specifically to the baggage that they think is being encrypted in transit and it's not. That's, that's, yeah. Yes. Yes, if you want to get into the weeds with that, um, yeah, because they're not encrypted in transit. So um, that's a good question, very good question. Yep. That's a good question. And so I would, it depends on sort of like your workflow. Um, and so if you're using, if you're exposing user IDs, I'll repeat the question. Um, he's asking where would you scrub the data after it's been either after or before it was pushed to say uh, FluentD or something like that. And it really depends on your workflow. Um, if you are, for instance, if you're using Graylog and you set up a keyword uh, alert based on a user IDs. And you want to know if a certain user ID is showing up in your logs because that user's been banned for something or something like that, right? You need that information in order to make that alert. But once that information has been sent to, say, Graylog, if you need to push that data further downstream for some Kafka job or something like data warehousing, then you could do that as part of that workflow. And so it really just kind of depends on, again, the more useful we make information, the more valuable it becomes. But once we are done with that usefulness, if you will, um, then you can further sanitize that information to make it safer, basically. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, not yet, they're being written files. Yeah, so we're not using, I'm not using the Secret Discovery API just yet. Um, that integration is in process. Any other questions? Awesome. Um, well, if you have any questions, feel free to poke me afterwards. Um, I'll be around for a while. I know that was a lot of information and I wanted to get through all of it. Um, but if you have any specific use cases or questions about how to implement this stuff, feel free to hit me up. Thank you.